I've been a cog in the machine of corporate America for years, spending my days in a glass and steel structure that reaches skyward in a show of modernity. It's a building where elevators are usually prompt, taking us to our respective floors like well-trained horses. Yet there was something off about Elevator D, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck prickle every time I stepped inside. Most days it worked just fine, but every once in a while, instead of reaching my floor, the display would flash zero and the doors would open. The first time it happened, I stepped out, bewildered, into what appeared to be the same building, except the air was thicker, tinged with the smell of cigarette smoke and stale coffee. Reception desk had an old rotary phone. The computers were bulky machines with cathode ray tube monitors, and the people, well, they were dressed like they'd walked out of a 1980s corporate manual. Suits with padded shoulders, men with mustaches that didn't seem ironic, and everyone engrossed in actual paper newspapers. I remember feeling disoriented, questioning my sanity as I wandered around the floor. When I got back in the elevator, it took me directly to my floor, in the year I belonged to, as though nothing had happened. I convinced myself it was stress, or maybe a prank orchestrated by the tech-savvy millennials in IT. However, it happened again, this time to my coworker, Lisa, who emerged from Elevator D with a look of bewilderment that I recognized immediately. We compared notes, verifying the impossible, that we had both traveled to the same bygone era. Our stories attracted a mixture of disbelief and awe and unease among our colleagues. We considered reporting it, but who would believe us? Elevator D became an enigma, a subject of jokes and nervous laughter. Some have claimed to have heard faint music emanating from its walls, the distant notes of a classic 80s rock ballad. Others felt a sudden drop in temperature as they passed it. But for me, Elevator D became an object of fascination, a tear in the fabric of reality that defied explanation. Each time the doors opened to floor zero, I found myself peering into a past untouched by the digital age, its people unaware that they were specters in a temporal anomaly. I never ventured far, never interacted with the people there. It felt intrusive, as if I were trespassing on a past that wasn't mine to disturb. So I'd linger near the elevator, studying the faces and fashions of a time I'd lived through but barely remembered, before returning to my own decade. The phenomenon continued sporadically over the years, New hires were initiated into the lore of Elevator D, although it remained unclear whether it was a technological glitch or something inexplicable, a sliver of another era sandwiched into our modern world. What does it mean? I still don't know. All I have are questions. Is Floor Zero aware of us, or are we just phantoms flickering in and out of their reality? Are there other elevators in other buildings that perform the same temporal magic? For now, Elevator D remains an unsolved mystery in a building otherwise dominated by logic and routine, a vertical time machine encased in steel, forcing us to confront the ephemeral nature of time itself, a silent reminder that the layers of the past are closer than we think hidden just beyond the doors that separate what is from what once was. I had always been a history buff, so when I landed a job as a night guard at the Tower of London, I was ecstatic. The tower, with its rich history and tales of imprisonment, torture, and executions, was a dream come true for someone like me. I had heard stories of ghostly apparitions and eerie sounds, 
but I never believed them. That was until one fateful night. It was a particularly cold evening, and the fog had rolled in, blanketing the tower in a thick, ghostly mist. My rounds took me to the White Tower, one of the oldest parts of the complex. As I walked through the dimly lit hallways, I felt a sudden drop in temperature. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just the old stone walls playing tricks on me. But as I approached one of the old cells, I heard it, a faint whisper. I paused, thinking I had imagined it, but then it came again, clearer this time. Help me, please. I approached the cell cautiously, my flashlight illuminating the empty space. There was no one there. The whispering continued, growing more desperate. Why won't anyone help me? I felt a chill run down my spine. I had heard tales of Anne Boleyn's ghost wandering the tower, but this didn't sound like a woman. It sounded like a young boy. I remembered the story of the two young princes, Edward and Richard, who were imprisoned in the tower and never seen again. Could this be one of them? I tried to communicate. Who are you? The voice responded its tone filled with sadness. I just want to go home. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to help, but how do you help a spirit? I decided to speak to one of the historians the next day. She told me about an old ritual from West Africa that was believed to help restless spirits find peace. I decided to give it a try. The next night, I brought some white candles and a small bowl of salt water. I placed them in the cell and began to chant the words the historian had given me. The atmosphere in the cell grew heavy, and the temperature dropped even further. The whispering voice returned. Thank you. The next day, the historian approached. Her face pale. She had been reviewing some old documents and found a letter written by one of the princes. It mentioned a secret hiding place in the cell where he had hidden a small toy. With her guidance, I found the toy, a tiny wooden horse. From that day on, the whispering stopped. I like to believe that the young prince's spirit found peace and was finally able to go home. Boston Opera House, a place of magnificence, where art and history meld into one. Its ornate architecture is a testament to bygone eras, and its walls have witnessed countless tales of passion, tragedy, and triumph. But there's one story that remains largely untold, hidden amidst the applause and standing ovations. It began on a night like any other. I was attending a performance of Swan Lake, a favorite of mine. As the ballet progressed, I became entranced by a dancer who wasn't listed in the program. Her movements were graceful, transcending the bounds of the stage, almost ethereal. Every pirouette and leap seemed to defy gravity. During the intermission, I inquired about her, but to my surprise, no one else seemed to have noticed her. They attributed my query to being captivated by the main performers, but I was certain of what I had seen. The ballet resumed, but she was nowhere in sight. That was until the final act. As the curtain slowly descended, she appeared at the edge of the stage, bathed in a single spotlight, dancing a melancholic solo. As her dance reached its climax, she vanished leaving only echoing silence behind. Intrigued, I decided to delve into the history of the Opera House. Buried in the archives, I found a tragic story from the 1920s. Lillian, a prodigious ballerina, was set to debut her solo performance. But on the eve of her premiere, she mysteriously vanished, never to be seen again. The lore goes that on some nights, when the moon is just right and the stars align, 
Lillian returns to the stage she never got to grace, dancing her heart out for an audience she never had. Returning to the opera house weeks later, I managed to find an elderly usher who had been working there for decades. When I mentioned Lillian, his eyes clouded with a mix of fear and sadness. He whispered to me that over the years, select attendees, especially those deeply passionate about ballet, have reported seeing a mysterious dancer, always during Swan Lake, always dancing a solo during the curtain call. Lillian's spirit, it seems, is forever intertwined with the opera house, her passion and dedication transcending time. She remains a silent testament to the artists of yesteryear, a reminder that art, in its purest form, is eternal. Now, every time I visit the Boston Opera House, I find a seat in the balcony, gazing at the stage, hoping to catch a glimpse of the timeless dancer, forever trapped between the world of the living and the embrace of the arts. I've been camping my entire life. Deserts, mountains, forests. I thought I'd seen it all. But Maine offered a different kind of solitude. An untouched landscape dotted with old Native American rock paintings that promised more than just a weekend away. It offered an opportunity to truly test myself. The challenge was simple survive a week in the deep woods with minimal supplies. Day one passed without a hitch. I set up a basic camp, caught some fish, and started a fire. As the evening wore on, I admired the rock paintings near my campsite. Figures of men and animals, but also of winged creatures that looked almost divine. That night, something changed. I woke up to find my camp disturbed. My food supply was nearly gone. Had it been an animal? Or perhaps another camper? But no, I was miles away from the nearest trail. A feeling of unease settled over me. On the second night, it happened again, but this time, I heard flapping wings and thunderous cries that shook the ground. Frightened, I clutched my knife and peered into the darkness. Nothing. By the third day, exhaustion was setting in, yet a curious feeling of anticipation overwhelmed me. I found more rock paintings. These depicted what looked like a giant bird locked in combat with human warriors. Thunderbird, the legend said, a powerful spirit creature of Native American folklore. On the final night, I heard the flapping wings again. This time, they were louder, closer. Summoning my courage, I stepped out of my tent and looked up. What I saw was magnificent and terrifying. A colossal bird, its feathers shimmering with an ethereal glow, its eyes like burning coals. It circled above me, and then, with a powerful cry that echoed through the woods, disappeared into the night sky. Morning light revealed no evidence of my nocturnal visitor but the feeling of awe remained. I had completed the challenge, but I realized the true test was not of my survival skills, but of my ability to face the unknown, to coexist with something greater than myself. As I packed up, I felt a newfound sense of respect, not just for nature, but for the ancient myths and legends that had lived long before me. I walked away from that week not just as a camper, but as someone who had been touched by something far older and far more mysterious than I had ever imagined. And so I left the forest, a place that had frightened yet enlightened me, knowing that the legend of the Thunderbird was real, at least for those willing to look beyond the veil of the ordinary world.
The old clock on the barn wall clanged midnight, just as I hauled the last musty bale up into the hayloft. I paused to wipe beads of sweat off my brow and take a deep, satisfying breath. The worn wooden walls creaked gently in the night breeze, mingling with the faint moos of Bessie settling down for bed. Outside, the farm was swallowed by inky darkness. Not even starlight pierced through the blanket of clouds tonight. After latching the heavy barn doors, I headed back home, anxious to put my feet up. But a prickle shivered up my spine before I'd gone even 20 paces. Something in the air felt off. The hairs on my neck stood at attention. The farm was as silent as a graveyard, not even the whisper of the wind through the cornfields. I froze in my tracks at the sound of panicked bleeding near the pasture. Old Margaret, the sheep, crying for help. I grabbed my flashlight and sprinted over, sweeping the feeble light across the field. It glinted off glassy eyes and tousled wool as the sheep bumped each other in distress. There, the light fixed on a horror hovered over Margaret's limp body. My heart seized at the sight of its emaciated frame, nothing but leathery hide clinging to jagged bones, coarse fur sprouting in mangy patches across its haggard body. But most terrifying was the row of spikes jutting from its arched, snarling back. The creature's head snapped toward me, glowing crimson eyes meeting mine. Blood dripped from jagged fangs bared in a gruesome sneer. Every childhood nightmare about the chupacabra sprang to life before my eyes. I stumbled back as it unleashed an ungodly screech that rattled my bones. Those hellish eyes bored into mine a moment more, and then the beast disappeared like a wisp of smoke into the darkness between heartbeats. I ran to Margaret, but it was too late. Her wool was matted with blood where the chupacabra had fed. Childhood myths warped into flesh and blood before my eyes, into razor fangs that had claimed another innocent life under the cloak of night. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said that we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up onto our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones, some so old they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely that they were cow bones. We came up for a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other and then built our fire even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen, and we settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about one o'clock in the morning, who said he swears he saw a torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. I really hammed it up making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners, fully believing this was my dad. The light from the torch fixed on our tent and then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside as well as some low mumbling. Dad had brought some friends in on the prank, dedicated. The torchlight came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. 
My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. At that point, I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely. Footsteps didn't recede, nothing like that. It just stopped. It stopped about an hour after it began. So we sat there for quite a while scared. Afterwards, we sat in total silence, aside from the sobbing of my buddies. And at dawn, we packed up and got the heck out of there. We got back to the house and dad was there. He apologized and said he had planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron, pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44 gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was definitely creepy. Driving late at night used to be my peace, a kind of therapy that required only gas money and an endless stretch of asphalt. The hum of the engine, the crisp air pouring in through the slightly open window. It was bliss until it wasn't. I had veered off the main highway onto some forgotten road, meandering through open farmland. Cornfields waved eerily in the night wind, forming dark walls on either side of me. No houses, no streetlights, just the glow of my headlights and the hypnotic emptiness of the road. Then the car choked, engine sputtering, dashboard lights flickering like dying stars. My foot jabbed at the gas pedal, but it was useless. Momentum carried me another hundred feet before the car stalled completely. The dashboard went dark and I was left with the high beams of my headlights casting feeble rays into the abyss ahead. I cursed, slamming my hands on the steering wheel. Come on, not now. Phone out, no signal, perfect. Glancing at the cornfields, I fought the instinctive dread curling into my stomach. I should have stayed on the highway. Just when I thought it couldn't get worse, a light flooded the car, bright, blinding, and entirely unnatural. It didn't radiate from a single point, but seemed to envelop everything, turning night into a glaring, strange day. I shielded my eyes, squinting to make sense of what was happening. Then, as quickly as it appeared, the light vanished. I blinked, trying to adjust to the sudden darkness. My car roared back to life, dashboard lights, engine, everything as if nothing had happened. I checked my phone. It had a full signal, the clock displaying a time two hours later than the last moment I remembered. With a trembling hand, I shifted into drive, eager to leave this damned road. The car moved, but something in the rearview mirror caught my eye. Among the rows of corn, something tall and slender moved, a distorted figure silhouetted against the dark, receding into the depths of the field. My foot slammed onto the accelerator, rocketing me away from whatever had just occurred. The rest of the ride home was a blur, my mind racing faster than the car's engine. I finally pulled into my driveway, safe under the familiar glow of my porch light. Yet as I turned off the engine, I glanced at the passenger seat. There, lying next to me, was a stalk of corn, freshly pulled from the ground, dirt still clinging to its roots. And etched into my dashboard, now burned into it, were unfamiliar symbols, cryptic and intricate, the meaning of which I couldn't fathom. I still drive, but never late at night, and never off the main highway. 
Whatever happened on that road, whatever that blinding light was, whatever the figure in the cornfield meant, I don't want answers. Some things are better left unknown. But sometimes when I start my car, the dashboard lights flicker, and I find unfamiliar roads on my GPS, routes I never took, but feel oddly compelled to follow. And though I always resist, the urge gets stronger each time, as if something out there isn't done with me yet. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, and a friend who awaited my shift's end. Given the peacefulness of the evening, I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street, and to the right there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant, Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. The pale morning sun filtered through the tall pines as I laced up my hiking boots and prepared for a day on the trails. I had backpacked deep into the Cascades to get away from the noise and stress of everyday life. Out here, I could be fully immersed in nature. Slipping on my pack, I consulted my map and set off down the trail. I hiked for several miles, the only sounds being the wind, rustling leaves, and my boots crunching on the forest floor. At a clearing, I stopped to sip some water and take in the view. Snow-capped peaks jutted up in the distance. All was tranquil. After stowing my water bottle, I stood and stretched my legs. 
Just then, a loud crack reverberated through the trees ahead. I froze. Another crack boomed, accompanied by heavy bipedal footsteps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. Gripping my walking stick, I called out nervously, Hello? The footsteps grew louder, branches snapping like gunshots. This was no bear or deer. It sounded like a person. But how? I was miles from civilization. Fear and fascination dueled within me. I wanted to flee, but my legs were paralyzed. The footsteps thudded closer, and suddenly, a massive creature stepped out from the pines. My heart nearly stopped. Standing before me was a huge, hair-covered beast, walking upright on two legs. It stood at least eight feet tall, with broad shoulders and muscular limbs. The face was obscured by a mane of reddish-brown hair, except for two dark, intelligent eyes gazing back at me. We stared at each other, neither of us moving a muscle. My mind reeled, unable to accept what I was seeing. Bigfoot. It couldn't be real, and yet here it was, the biggest discovery in natural history, living and breathing. Slowly, Bigfoot leaned forward, eyes piercing into me with uncanny awareness. It was analyzing me as I tried fruitlessly to analyze it. I was in awe, overwhelmed by this mythical beast made real. Then, calmly, it turned and sauntered back into the ancient forest. I watched, dumbstruck, until it disappeared like a ghost. I hurried down the trail, hands shaking. I knew my claims would be ridiculed and dismissed, but I didn't need validation. My reality had been irrevocably shifted. I had witnessed something beyond explanation, a glimpse into the unknown. Somewhere out there, Bigfoot still dwells, a humbling reminder that nature still holds secrets beyond our grasp. I will forever cherish the brief wonder of our encounter. I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion. But I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of and one that was about two and a half hours away, up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old Forest Service ranger station and a newer double-wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I wanted to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night he told me he was cowboy camping, which means sleeping outside with no tent. And he kept getting a weird mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling, but no one was around him. He told me he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't sap, but he never slept outside there again, which leads me to believe he was telling the truth. For my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. 
Everyone went to bed pretty early because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still. And I heard one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the heck outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice. I just lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually it stopped and somehow I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt too weird to ask. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it's still weird. I work as an archivist in the San Juan Capistrano Public Library. The library, aside from its usual fare of books and multimedia, has a small but significant collection of historical documents, old photographs, and newspapers, most of them related to the famous Mission San Juan Capistrano. The mission is known for many things, most popularly for the return of the swallows every year, but it also has darker legends. Among them is the haunting of a woman named La Llorona. La Llorona is the weeping woman, a legend that transcends all boundaries. While its origins are in Mexican folklore, the story has found resonance in California as well. The version that circulates here tells of a woman who was betrayed by her love and, in a fit of despair, drowned her children in the Mission's Creek. Realizing what she'd done, she wailed loudly, a cry so devastating that it's said to still reverberate on moonlit nights around the mission grounds. Now, I've always been skeptical of legends and myths. To me, they were cautionary tales to keep children obedient, or stories to add flavor to a town's history. That was until one winter evening, when I stumbled upon something uncanny. I was working late, sorting through a recent donation of old newspapers and photographs. A particular photograph caught my eye. It was a grainy black and white picture of a group of people standing in front of the mission. I couldn't place the date, but their clothing looked like they were from the early 1900s. What intrigued me was the faint outline of a woman standing apart from the group, her eyes hollow and her expression one of despair. Curious, I decided to scan the image to examine it more closely, but when the scan came through, the mysterious woman was missing from the image. I cleaned the scanner, thinking it was a malfunction, but she remained absent in every subsequent scan. Puzzled, I decided to lock up for the night. I left the library and began my short walk past the mission on my way home. The mission's bells hung silently in the Campanario, and a bright moon hung overhead. I felt the air around me grow colder, and a soft cry echoed on the wind, a wailing that seemed to seep from the very walls of the mission. Chilled, I picked up my pace. As I crossed the bridge over the creek, where La Llorona was said to have committed her terrible act, I heard a splash. I turned around, and in the moonlight I saw a figure standing in the water, a woman, her eyes hollow, and her face filled with an eternal sorrow. Our eyes met for just a moment, and a shiver ran down my spine. Then she vanished, and the crying ceased. I ran home, my skepticism shattered. 
The next day I found the photograph missing from the collection, as if it had never existed. Since that night, I've not heard the wailing again, but I've also never doubted the legend of La Llorona. So, if you ever find yourself near the mission on a moonlit night, and hear a soft cry on the wind, remember the tale of the weeping woman, and know that some legends are grounded in a reality we may never fully understand. The painting caught my eye at a local estate sale. It depicted a figure, a woman dressed in a flowing Victorian era gown, standing at the edge of a dense forest. Her face was obscured by a veil, but there was an undeniable allure to her posture, a sense of mystery that drew me in. Without much thought, I purchased the painting and hung it in my living room. The first few days, it served as a conversation piece guests would comment on its haunting beauty, speculating about the identity of the woman and the artist who painted her. But as the days turned into weeks, I began to notice something unsettling. Every morning as I passed by the painting, it seemed as though the figure had moved ever so slightly. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light, or my imagination playing games. But day by day, the woman in the painting seemed to be inching closer, moving from the edge of the forest toward the foreground. I tried to rationalize it. Perhaps the paint was reacting to the humidity, or maybe the canvas was warping. But deep down, I knew something supernatural was at play. One evening, as I sat reading in the living room, I glanced up at the painting and froze. The woman was no longer at the edge of the forest. She was now at the very front of the canvas, her veiled face mere inches from breaking free. And as I stared, I could have sworn I saw the fabric of her veil flutter, as if caught in a gentle breeze. Disturbed, I decided to research the painting's origins. A deep dive into local archives led me to a tragic tale from the late 1800s. The woman in the painting was Lady Eleanor, a noblewoman who had vanished without a trace. She was last seen entering the very forest depicted in the painting, and despite extensive searches, no trace of her was ever found. Rumors swirled about her fate. Some believed she had been taken by spirits, while others whispered about a forbidden romance and a heartbroken departure. But one thing was clear. The artist who painted her was deeply in love with Eleanor and devastated by her disappearance. In his grief, he painted the haunting portrait, pouring all his longing and sorrow into the canvas. Realizing the situation, I sought the help of a local medium. She sensed a powerful energy emanating from the painting. The spirits of both Eleanor and the artist intertwined in a dance of love and loss. To free them, we held a seance. As the medium chanted, the room grew cold and the painting seemed to come alive. The forest in the background rustled and Lady Eleanor's veil lifted, revealing a face of ethereal beauty. A soft voice echoed through the room, expressing gratitude for being seen and remembered. With a final heart-rending sigh, the figure in the painting retreated returning to her original position at the edge of the forest. The room warmed and a sense of peace settled over everything. The painting remains in my living room, its beauty undiminished. But now when I look at it, I see not just a portrait of a lost noblewoman, but a testament to the power of love, a reminder that even in death, our stories continue, waiting for someone to bear witness. The house was a deal too good to pass up, an old Victorian, slightly worn around the edges, but full of character. 
situated on a quiet street lined with mature trees. Sarah and I felt an immediate connection, an unspoken agreement passing between us the moment we stepped inside. We moved in within the month. Could use a fresh coat of paint, Sarah said, her voice bouncing off the empty walls. I laughed, and then a second later heard another laugh, a soft, hollow replication that settled uneasily in the room. Not my laugh, not Sarah's. We exchanged glances but shrugged it off. Weeks rolled on. We unpacked painted walls, filled rooms with furniture and photographs, yet the echo remained. If we laughed, it laughed, just moments too late. If we raised our voices, the house seemed to speak back in a tone that was never quite ours. It's old, I rationalized. Old houses have quirks. Sarah looked unconvinced but nodded. Yeah, quirks, let's go with that. Days turned into weeks. The echo became an invisible tenant, woven into the fabric of our daily lives. But as time passed, it grew less mimetic and more distinct, its timber deepening, its laughter souring into something like a jeer. It's not normal, Dave, Sarah finally admitted one night. We need to find out what it is. I nodded, my gut echoing her unease. We started with simple tests, trying to catch the echo off guard, determine its origin, shouting into empty rooms, recording the spaces with our phones. But every recording played back clean, as if the echo refused to be caught. Frustrated, we invited an acoustics expert to assess the house. He walked through each room, taking measurements, scratching his head. The structure's sound, no reason for any sort of echo, he declared, packing his gear, and certainly not the kind you described. Yet the echo persisted, growing louder with each passing day. In an act of last resort, we brought in a medium, a small woman with graying hair and a face etched with lines of experience. She walked through the house, pausing in the living room where the echo was strongest. Closing her eyes, she said, There's another layer to this house, another skin. It's trying to communicate, but it's trapped between worlds. Can you free it? Sarah asked, her voice tinged with desperation. The medium shook her head. No, but you need to leave. It's growing stronger with your presence feeding off your emotions. We didn't need any more convincing. We moved out within the week, finding a modern apartment devoid of echoes or invisible tenants. The old house was left behind, but the echo has never really left us. It's become a yardstick of the unexplainable, a reminder that some walls don't just hold up a roof, they hold secrets too profound for our understanding. It taught us to listen, not just to the noises that fill a space, but to the silence that seeks to speak, to the echo that isn't our own but yearns to be heard. Boston is a city steeped in history, its very streets echoing tales from centuries past. But there's one story that's been passed down through my family that, until recently, I dismissed as mere lore. King's Chapel Burial Ground, established in 1630, it's one of the oldest cemeteries in the city. If you've ever walked its paths, you felt the weight of history bearing down an overwhelming sensation of being watched. One crisp autumn evening, after an exhaustive study session at the nearby library, I decided to take a shortcut through the burial ground. Mist clung to the ground, and the city's ambient glow bathed the gravestones in an ethereal light. As I ventured deeper, an icy gust sent shivers down my spine. The hairs on the back of my neck prickled. As I heard a faint whisper, a voice saturated with pain and longing. It murmured, Elizabeth. Startled, I spun around. 
but there was no one. Yet the whisper persisted, becoming more plaintive, seemingly emanating from a grand weather-worn tombstone. As I approached, I could barely make out the inscription, here lies Elizabeth, beloved daughter, taken too soon. Suddenly, a figure materialized before me. Dressed in colonial attire, her pale face was a canvas of anguish. Her translucent hand gestured towards the grave, and in her mournful eyes, I saw an eternity of regret. Feeling a magnetic pull, I found myself entranced by Elizabeth's story. Local lore claims she was a young woman of great beauty and spirit, who tragically died of a mysterious illness. Her father, a wealthy merchant, was so grief-stricken that he'd often be heard lamenting by her grave, even years after her passing. As the minutes ticked by, the spirit of Elizabeth seemed to be drawing energy from my presence, becoming more vibrant and tangible. She reached out, her fingers just grazing my arm, sending a jolt of icy cold through my body. The world around me started to blur, the modern cityscape of Boston fading as the burial ground transformed to its colonial visage. Before I could comprehend what was unfolding, a firm grip on my shoulder yanked me back to reality. A concerned passerby stood beside me, inquiring if I was all right. Elizabeth's apparition had vanished, but the weight of her sorrow remained, imprinted on my soul. I left King's Chapel burial ground that night with a newfound respect for Boston's storied past. Our city, while a beacon of progress, is also a guardian of souls, forever echoing with the whispers of those who walked its cobbled streets before us. In Boston, history isn't just a thing of the past, it's very much alive, lingering in the shadows of our present. In the small town of Wiltshire, England, the appearance of crop circles was not an uncommon occurrence. Most locals dismissed them as pranks or natural phenomena. But for teenagers Maya and Rowan, they were a source of endless fascination. One summer evening in 1998, a particularly intricate crop circle appeared in a field on the outskirts of town. The design was unlike any other, with complex geometric patterns and symbols that seemed to tell a story. Maya and Rowan, armed with a camcorder and a sense of adventure, decided to sneak into the field at night and document their findings. The moonlight cast an eerie glow over the flattened crops as the duo made their way to the center of the circle. They began filming, capturing the intricate details of the design and speculating on its origins. But as they delved deeper into the circle, they began to notice something strange. The air grew colder, and a faint whispering sound filled the air. They couldn't make out the words, but the voices seemed to be coming from the ground itself. Rowan, ever the skeptic, dismissed it as the wind or some nearby animals, but Maya was not so sure. She placed the camcorder on the ground, pointing it toward the center of the circle, and hit record. The two sat in silence, listening intently. The whispering grew louder, more distinct. It was a chorus of voices, speaking in a language neither of them recognized. The voices seemed to be conveying a message, a warning. Suddenly, the ground beneath them began to vibrate. The whispering grew more frantic, more urgent. Maya and Rowan, overcome with fear, grabbed the camcorder and ran. They didn't stop until they reached the safety of Maya's house. Panting and shaken, they played back the footage. To their astonishment, the camcorder had captured the whispering in crystal clear audio. The voices, though still unintelligible, were unmistakably otherworldly. The duo uploaded the footage to the early internet, where it quickly went viral. UFO enthusiasts and skeptics alike were baffled by the recording. 
Linguists attempted to decipher the language, but it didn't match any known to man. The crop circle was soon cordoned off by local authorities, and a team of scientists was brought in to investigate, but no explanation of the phenomenon was ever found. Maya and Rowan's footage became the subject of countless documentaries and investigations. The crop circle whispers, as they became known, were hailed as some of the most compelling evidence of extraterrestrial contact. The two teenagers became overnight celebrities, but they remained grounded, always emphasizing the importance of seeking the truth and keeping an open mind. The crop circle eventually faded, and the field returned to its natural state. But the mystery of that summer night in Wiltshire remained, a testament to the unknown wonders of the universe. The forests of Maine have always been a sanctuary for me, a place where I can lose myself in the serenity of towering trees and hidden lakes. But during a late summer camping trip in one of the state's more secluded forests, that sanctuary would become the setting for an experience so bizarre, it shook the very foundations of what I thought I knew about the natural world. After a day spent hiking and fishing, I settled into my campsite as night began to fall. The air was thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, and the only sounds were the gentle rustle of leaves and the distant hooting of an owl. As I sat by my campfire, engrossed in a book, I felt a sudden change in the atmosphere, a subtle but palpable shift that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. That's when I heard it. A low, almost guttural growl emanating from the woods beyond the circle of firelight. I snapped my head up, scanning the darkness that surrounded me, but saw nothing. Still, the feeling of being watched, of not being alone, continued to grow. Clutching my flashlight, I decided to investigate. Guided only by the narrow beam of light, and my mounting trepidation, I moved cautiously through the trees, my senses heightened, my footsteps muffled on the forest floor. Then I saw them, eyes, two glowing orbs floating just above ground level, staring directly at me. My heart pounded as I aimed the flashlight at them, revealing a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. Covered in dark, mottled fur, it was hunched over, its long, sinewy arms almost touching the ground. But it was the creature's face that captivated me, a haunting blend of human and animal features with an almost sorrowful expression. As our eyes met, the creature let out a soft, mournful cry, a sound that echoed through the woods and seemed to reverberate within me. Suddenly, as if startled by its own vulnerability, the creature swiftly turned and disappeared into the forest, its form blending seamlessly into the darkness, leaving me alone with my shock and disbelief. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing. Had I just encountered a cryptid? One of those mythical creatures that exist on the fringes of science and folklore? My thoughts turned to local legends of the Turner Beast, a mysterious creature said to roam the Maine woods, and I wondered if what I had seen was connected to these tales. Sleep did not come easily that night, and when dawn broke, I packed up and left. Driven not by fear, but by an overwhelming sense of awe and wonder. As I made my way back to civilization, I felt a profound shift in my understanding of the world, a newfound respect for the mysteries that still linger in the hidden corners of our planet. I've returned to those woods several times since that night, always with a sense of anticipation and reverence, 
hoping for another glimpse of the unknown. And while I have yet to encounter the creature again, the experience remains etched in my memory, a constant reminder that in the depths of the main forests, something extraordinary waits, existing in the space between legend and reality. Havana has its own rhythm, a pulsating beat that thrives in the narrow alleys, the crowded cafes, and the colorful facades that line its streets. But beyond the city, where the sand meets the Caribbean Sea, there's a different kind of music, a melody that belongs to the night, and to the folklore that resides in the collective memory of the locals. I was drawn to it, this phenomenon that everyone spoke of but few outsiders had experienced. I took to the beach just before midnight, a bottle of rum in my hand, a cigar in my pocket, and an air of skepticism swirling around me. The moon hung like a silver crescent in the ink-black sky, casting a soft glow on the water. Waves lapped lazily at the shore, their white foam fizzling out as they retreated. I settled on a driftwood log, eyes on the horizon, ears attuned to the natural symphony of the sea. Then, as the clock hands united in their midnight embrace, it happened. A melody wafted through the salty air, a haunting tune plucked on an invisible guitar. The sound was ethereal yet precise, as if each note were being played with calculated affection. It seemed to rise from the depths of the ocean, filling the space between the sea and the stars. The locals, they told of a pirate, a corsair from the golden age of sail, who'd met his tragic end on these shores. Shipwrecked and separated from his beloved, he'd drowned in a storm while clutching a golden locket, a last memento of his lost love. They said this melody was his spirit's serenade, a nocturnal tribute that soared over the waters he'd perished in. I sat there, wrapped in the musical veil, transported by its otherworldly beauty. Each chord struck resonated with a mix of sorrow and yearning, as if the pirate spirit was bearing its soul, reliving a love that could never be reclaimed yet refused to be forgotten. As abruptly as it started, the melody ceased. The sounds of the ocean rushed back in, reclaiming their dominion. But the atmosphere had changed. The beach felt fuller, as though it had been momentarily inhabited by a presence that transcended human lifetimes, an emotion that defied the constraints of language. I left the beach that night with more than grains of sand clinging to my shoes. I carried away the echo of a melody, the ghost of a story, and a newfound respect for the thin membrane that separates the explainable from the mysterious. In a land known for its vibrant music, its lively dances, and its rich history, that midnight melody stands apart, a haunting refrain that links the past to the present, folklore to reality, and above all love to loss. The locals may attribute it to a pirate's restless spirit, but to me, it represents something more universal. The enduring power of love and music to transcend the boundaries of time and death, forever imprinted on the canvas of the Cuban beach, forever echoing in the chambers of the heart. I'll never forget the summer night my friends and I decided to explore the waterfall and creek on my family's rural property. We were bored teens looking for adventure. Little did we know what we would awaken. As dusk faded to darkness, we hiked along the creek, conjuring imaginary monsters in the shadows. Reaching the waterfall, we scrambled up the slippery rocks, laughter echoing. 
Behind the cascading water, a recess opened in the cliffside. Flashlight beams revealed a tunnel leading back into darkness. Grinning, we ducked inside, the roar of the falls fading behind us. The narrow cave passage spiraled deep into the earth, dripping water eroding strange patterns on the walls. It felt primal, pristine. Our voices bounced eerily down the unknown corridor. Finally, the tunnel opened into a high-ceilinged cavern with gigantic stalactites hanging like stone daggers. We craned our necks, awestruck. It was like entering a natural cathedral. Venturing farther, we stumbled upon something incredible, an underground lake, ink black and still as glass. Stalagmites ringed the shore like stone sentries. The place seemed off somehow, heavy with secrets best left undisturbed. Shivering despite the cavern's warmth, I turned to leave. The others begged to stay and explore, their voices too loud in the oppressive silence. Then, the still black lake began to ripple. At first, just faintly, then increasing until the entire surface roiled and churned violently, frothing white. My friend's laughter turned to screams. I shouted for everyone to run. We tore back through the twisting passageway as roaring filled the cavern, terrible and deafening. I chanced a backward glance and saw a pale, sinuous shape rising from the frothing water, malformed and gargantuan. We scrambled desperately up the slick tunnel, lungs burning, that monstrous roar pursuing us. Finally, we tumbled out behind the waterfall and sprinted down the wooded trail. At the farmhouse, we collapsed, gasping but too terrified to speak of what had awakened in that buried abyss. I only know we unleashed something primeval, lurking in those sunless depths since the dawn of time something that knows the surface world still waits above, full of light and life, not yet corrupted. The cave entrance now lies collapsed, sealed shut by a recent quake, according to geologists, but deep in my bones, I know the truth, that the tunnel collapse was no quake. It was the only way to re-entomb that which we should never have freed. I still have nightmares of the warped white form erupting from the subterranean lake, slamming into the cave walls in chaotic rage, as it surged toward the surface, toward freedom. Whatever that ancient thing was, it thirsts to be unleashed, and I fear one day it may finish crawling out of the depths we disturbed, its patience eternal. As an experienced backpacker and nature photographer, I've hiked hundreds of miles through remote wilderness over the years, but nothing could prepare me for the terror I experienced last week while camping alone in the Boundary Waters. I had hiked deep into the network of lakes and streams, excited to spend a few days completely immersed in nature and solitude. The first night went perfectly. I cooked dinner fireside as the sun set, and then curled up in my tent listening to loons call across the lake. The next morning, I set off hiking again with my camera, hoping to photograph some wildlife. I stopped frequently to snap photos of birds, deer, and other creatures. Late in the afternoon, I came across huge, mysterious tracks in the mud along the trail. They looked somewhat human but enormous, with only four toes. Unease trickled down my spine, but I shook it off and continued. I set up camp that evening on a scenic ridge. While boiling water for my freeze-dried dinner, the forest suddenly fell eerily silent. The birds even stopped singing. Every nerve tingled with the sense something was watching me. Glancing up, I saw a face peering from the brush. 
chalk-white skin, sunken eyes, and a lipless mouth gazing right at me. I shouted in alarm, jumping back. The face vanished. I grabbed a stick from the fire and thrust it toward the bushes, hands shaking, but nothing was there. I spent that night huddled by the dying fire, unable to sleep. At dawn, I discovered enormous man-like footprints circling my tent and dragging from the bushes a long trail where something heavy had been pulled into the forest. Fighting panic, I decided to hike out as fast as possible. All day, I had the creepy feeling of being followed. Twice, I heard odd whooping cries from a ridge parallel to me. They didn't sound like any normal animal. At one point, across a stream, a dead deer lay mutilated, as if flung savagely against a tree trunk. Nerves on edge, I pushed onward. I hiked hours past my usual stopping time, desperate to put distance between me and that thing. Exhausted, I finally made camp after nightfall in a meadow. I boiled water for dinner, but was too wired to eat. The woods were silent as a crypt. Later, drifting off to sleep, I dreamed of hearing footsteps outside the tent. Suddenly, the tent unzipped, and I awoke with a start to see a pale, grinning face staring down from the opening, empty black eyes meeting mine. I screamed and kicked out wildly. The face vanished. Heart racing, I peered outside with my flashlight. Huge, bare footprints surrounded the tent, but the night was still in quiet once more. At dawn, I packed up and practically ran the last few miles back to my truck, constantly glancing over my shoulder. Only when I was driving away did I finally relax, profoundly thankful to have escaped with my life. My eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early twenties, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment. But what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off, yet I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, 
my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, she let out a wail, a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say, but I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. Last fall, I took a solo camping trip into the Ozarks. I've always found peace in the solitude of nature, the calmness of trees, and the serenity of the night sky. The mountains were a place I thought would be a haven from the hustle of daily life. Little did I know, I was stepping into a realm where the border between the living and the dead was unsettlingly thin. I set up camp in a small clearing surrounded by the dense forest a good distance from any trails. The first day passed without incident, filled with hiking and taking photographs of the breathtaking scenery. As the sun set, I settled in for the night, the fire casting long shadows between the trees. That's when I first noticed the stillness. The woods are never silent. There's always the rustle of small animals, the chirping of crickets, the whisper of the wind. But that night, there was nothing, like the forest was holding its breath. It started with a mist, creeping in from the fringes of the woods, unnatural and thick, swallowing up the light from my fire until the flames flickered feebly in the fog. Then the figures appeared. They were faint, barely more than less dense areas within the mist, human-shaped but indistinct. They moved around the periphery of my camp, shifting in and out of focus, Frozen in place, I could only watch as more figures emerged, forming a spectral audience around me. None made a sound, and none approached the firelight's edge. They simply watched. It felt like a standoff between the living and the dead, the minutes stretching into an eternity as the apparitions surrounded me. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, with a gust of wind, they were gone. The mist receded, the natural sounds of the forest returned, and I was alone once more. The fire had burnt down to embers during the encounter, giving me a stark reminder of how much time had passed. I was hesitant to sleep, fearing they would return if I let my guard down. Morning couldn't come fast enough. Once the sun rose, I packed up my camp faster than ever before, the memory of the ghostly figures pressing me to hurry. I practically ran out of the woods, and it wasn't until I reached my car that I finally felt safe enough to catch my breath. After I had gotten home, a local historian enlightened me. The area where I had camped was near a historic trail that many early settlers used to travel west. Numerous people perished on that journey, succumbing to the hardships of the wilderness. They were buried hastily, their graves unmarked and forgotten scattered throughout the forest. My encounter with the phantoms of the Ozarks has stayed with me. The images of those ghostly figures, appearing within the mist and the oppressive sensation of being surrounded, 
still invade my dreams. The mountains, with their sprawling forests, towering peaks, and hidden graves, hold many secrets, and some, it seems, occasionally walk back into the light to be seen. In the heart of the Brazilian Amazon, the rainforest is a living entity, its voice woven from the polyphonic chorus of flora and fauna. Explorers speak of it in reverent tones, and locals treat it with a mix of respect and sacredness. As a sound ethnographer, I've collected sonic landscapes from around the world, but nothing prepared me for the mystery I'd encountered deep in the Brazilian rainforest, a lullaby that didn't belong to any human tongue yet carried the weight of ancient lullabies hummed by mothers across millennia. The rumor was prevalent among the native communities. They spoke of Ocanto de la Floresta, the song of the forest, a lullaby that the forest sings to itself when night lays its dark veil over the Amazon. Intrigued and armed with cutting-edge recording equipment, I ventured into the dense labyrinth of trees and waterways led by Rodrigo, a local guide whose knowledge of the forest was intuitive, gained from a lifetime of coexistence. As darkness enveloped the forest, a profound stillness settled in, a pause in the continuous murmur that characterized the daytime hours. Rodrigo signaled for us to stop and listen. The air grew thick with anticipation, each moment stretching, as if time itself was holding its breath. And then it began. A melody emerged from the depths of the forest, delicate and haunting. It floated on the night air, ethereal yet distinct, a sequence of notes that resembled a lullaby, cradling everything it touched in a gentle embrace. Though no human lips were shaping these sounds, the tune reverberated with an emotional timbre that struck a universal chord. My fingers trembled slightly as I set up the recording equipment, but when I pressed the record button, the melody suddenly faltered, its notes scattering like startled birds. A wave of chills cascaded down my spine. The forest had sensed the intrusion. Its song was not for capturing. It was a gift for those willing to listen, to be present. We should not try to cage what is free, Rodrigo whispered, his words imbued with a wisdom that transcended the moment. As we trekked back, the forest resumed its nocturnal serenade, the notes lingering behind us like a gossamer trail. Though I returned with empty audio files, the resonance of that night stayed with me, humming softly in the corners of my memory. Back in my world of decibels and frequencies, where every sound is dissected and analyzed, the Amazon's mysterious lullaby defies categorization. It has seeped into my own understanding of sound, of its primal power to communicate beyond words or definitions. Now, when people ask about the most extraordinary sound I've ever heard, I think of the Amazon's lullaby, its invisible notes woven into the very fabric of the rainforest. While the experience eludes quantification, it thrives in the realm of the inexplicable. And isn't it precisely these enigmas, these whispers from beyond the veil of comprehension, that make our world infinitely richer, a symphony of unspoken connections. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha, our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected, the radio tuned into a station, WVLR Memories 88.9,
and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this. That summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke, we had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside, with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended, and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade, and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. Flat tire, middle of nowhere, no cell reception, the trifecta of a road trip gone bad. I cursed under my breath as I surveyed the situation. My car sat lopsided on the gravel road, as desolate a spot as you could imagine. The sky was beginning to bruise with twilight, and the prospects of changing a tire in the dark were far from appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, headlights appeared in my rearview mirror, a pickup truck, ancient but well kept, slowing down as it approached. A sliver of hope. Maybe I wasn't so unlucky after all. The truck parked behind me and out stepped a man, older, weather-beaten but spry. His overalls were stained with years of oil and grit, the name Eugene embroidered above his heart. Looks like you could use some help, he said, squinting at my flat tire. Would be much appreciated, I replied, relief washing over me. Eugene moved with a quiet efficiency unpacking his toolkit and getting to work. His hands were strong, deft, each movement precise. In no time, he had the flat tire off and the spare on. There you go, he said, wiping his hands on a rag. Good as new. I couldn't believe my luck. How much do I owe you? He waved a dismissive hand. Consider it a favor. Just pay it forward when you can. I thanked him profusely 
still awed by the timely intervention. As he drove away, his truck's taillights faded into the encroaching darkness, as if swallowed whole. When I got back into town, I headed straight for the nearest garage to get a proper tire replacement. While there, I mentioned Eugene and how he'd helped me out. The mechanic paused, his face turning a shade paler. Did you say Eugene? Drives an old Ford pickup? Yeah, that's him. Know him. The mechanic looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Eugene's been dead for years, passed away in that very truck, a collision up on Millersfield Road. A cold shiver trickled down my spine. That's impossible. He helped me just a couple hours ago, changed my flat tire and everything. The mechanic stared, then walked over to a cluttered bulletin board on the wall. He shuffled through various papers and pulled out a faded newspaper clipping, handed it to me. The headline read, Local Mechanic Dies in Tragic Accident. And there he was, Eugene, unmistakable despite the grainy black and white photograph that familiar smile, those wise eyes. I felt my knees weaken, my stomach turn. Looks like Eugene's still looking out for folks, the mechanic murmured, reclaiming the article and pinning it back on the board. I left the garage in a daze, new tire in place, but my understanding of reality irrevocably altered. I had been helped by a man who was no longer of this world, a long dead handyman still aiding travelers in distress. As I drove away, the thought weighed on me, heavy but oddly comforting. Whatever force let Eugene linger, it was a benevolent one, a shred of goodness stitched into the fabric of an otherwise indifferent universe. And as I merged onto the highway, my eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see those headlights one more time. But all that met my gaze was the open road and the gathering night. Fishing was in my blood. Generations of navigating choppy waters, mending nets and hauling catches. The sea was both my livelihood and my sanctuary, a realm of endless horizons and hidden depths. But that night, as we sailed under the cover of darkness, the ocean revealed a side I had never seen, nor ever wished to see again. We cast our nets like we had a thousand times before. As they sank, we adjusted our sonar, scanning for schools of fish, but something else caught my eye, an unidentified object hovering near the ocean floor. It was too symmetrical, too stationary to be a school of fish or debris. My gaze shifted between the sonar and the inky sea, curiosity edging into apprehension. A murmur of uncertainty rippled among the crew. Our eyes were locked on the depths below when it happened. A surge of luminescence emanated from the object casting bright beams that sliced through the darkness like celestial spotlights. The ship trembled as if jarred by an invisible hand. Our sonar scrambled, then blinked out. We peered into the water, where the source of the light remained elusive, but its effects were undeniable. Around us, the ocean started to bubble, as if reaching a rolling boil. I touched the surface with my hand, it was unnaturally warm, like bath water. What came next was the most haunting of all. Fish, by the hundreds, floated to the surface, lifeless. Their scales shimmered in the unsettling light, their eyes vacant. The crew was paralyzed, transfixed by the spectacle, as if witnessing an arcane ritual for which we were never meant to be the audience. The boiling ceased and the waters grew still. The object, whatever it was, started to ascend, its lights dimming as it moved. With a final pulse, it shot upwards, piercing the water's surface and soaring into the sky at a speed that defied comprehension. We were left in a deafening silence, 
surrounded by the aftermath of unexplained phenomena and inexplicable deaths. I restarted the sonar. It flickered back to life, revealing an empty stretch of seafloor, as if the object had never existed. We decided, unanimously and without discussion, to cut our expedition short. We hauled in our nets, now carrying a grim cargo of dead fish, and set course for home. As we sailed back, the lighthouse guiding us through the dark felt different, as if its beam were now too shallow to reach the places we had glimpsed. That night remains etched in our minds, a haunting intersection between the known and the unknown. We return to fishing because it's what we do, but something has shifted. We cast our nets with a heightened awareness of what lies beneath, of the mysteries that dwell in the ocean's depths. Conversations on the ship have a new undertone, a recognition that the sea, our lifelong companion, harbors secrets beyond our grasp, realms that defy our maps and challenge our dominion. And in the rare moments when our sonar detects something unusual, when an unexplained warmth graces the waters, or a strange light flickers in the distance, we find ourselves glancing skyward, pondering the true expanse of our world and the mysteries that lurk beneath its surface. We gathered at the shrine, a motley congregation of pilgrims seeking miracles and skeptics drawn by the spectacle. Perched high in the mountains, the ancient sanctuary had long been considered a sacred vortex by believers and a curiosity by others. Scholars debated its origins. Ancient alien theorists claimed it was a cosmic portal, while archaeologists argued for its terrestrial roots. As night settled, a communal energy enveloped us. Huddled in makeshift tents and wrapped in blankets, we chanted, prayed, or simply marveled at the sheer cliff faces that held us in their stony embrace. The sky, a sweeping dome of darkness, became a canvas of celestial patterns, stars tracing arcs that had fascinated humanity for millennia. But then, an anomaly, brighter and faster than any known comet, streaked across the sky. The flash was blinding, followed by a spectacle that defied comprehension. An intricate array of luminous glyphs materialized, suspended in the night sky like celestial calligraphy. They shimmered, radiant yet otherworldly, before arranging themselves into a configuration that mirrored the geometry of the shrine itself. The crowd fell silent, a collective awe binding us. I looked around. Faces I had barely noticed during the day were now illuminated in reverence or shock, each expression a unique response to the inexplicable. Phones were raised, cameras activated, but no device could capture the event. Each attempted photograph resulted in a blur, a smudge, as if the sky refused to be documented. The glyphs held their formation for a span of time that felt eternal yet ephemeral as if we were all suspended in a pocket of reality, separate from the natural world. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, the glyphs dissolved, their luminosity retreating into a pinpoint of light that shot upwards and disappeared into the cosmos. For the remainder of the night, the sanctuary was enveloped in a profound quietude, broken only by the murmur of whispered prayers or soft sobs. Some pilgrims claimed to feel a presence among us, a spectral energy that defied natural explanation. Others delved into ancient astronaut theories, fervently discussing how the event confirmed speculations of extraterrestrial involvement in human history. As for me, I lay in my tent, staring at the now empty sky, pondering the alignment between the celestial event and the geometry of the shrine. The symmetry was too perfect, the timing too coincidental for a purely natural occurrence. Yet it defied all scientific logic, hovering in the realm of the inexplicable.
nestled between divine intervention and extraterrestrial communication. We left the sanctuary as dawn broke, each of us carrying the weight of an event that would forever oscillate between belief and skepticism, faith and inquiry. The path back to the mundane world felt both short and interminable, as if we were crossing not just geographical distance, but also dimensions of understanding. And while life resumed its familiar patterns, the experience remained, a spectral event imprinted on the collective consciousness of those who witnessed it. No proof, no tangible evidence, just the haunting resonance of a night when the sky spoke in glyphs and the earth listened in awe. In Eureka Springs, hidden by overgrowth and surrounded by a heavy silence, sits the skeleton of an old asylum. As an avid explorer of abandoned places, I couldn't resist the allure of its crumbling walls and the secrets they held. I had heard the local tales of strange happenings, ghostly sightings, and an oppressive aura of despair that clung to the place. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, I found myself drawn there on a cool autumn afternoon, camera in hand. The asylum was a haunting sight, with nature clawing back every inch of the grounds. Inside, it was much the same. Time had peeled the paint from the walls, and debris littered the hallways. Each step I took kicked up years of dust, and the only sound was the distant caw of crows outside. As I explored, I entered what looked to have been a patient's room, relatively intact compared to others. And there, among the decay, I found a diary, its pages yellowed with age, the leather cover worn. Compelled by curiosity, I perched on a broken chair and began to read, the silence of the asylum pressing in around me. The diary belonged to a woman who had been a patient there. Her entries started as mundane, detailing her confusion, her life within the asylum walls, and her growing despair. But as the pages turned, her writings took on a frantic tone. She began to speak of a presence, a malevolent spirit she called the Shadow Man. She wrote of how the Shadow Man whispered cruel things, how he reveled in the anguish of the patients, and how he seemed to feed off the darkness that enveloped their lives. Her descriptions grew more vivid with each encounter, the chill of his touch, the way the shadows seemed to twist into sinister shapes in his presence, the way darkness seemed to deepen, consuming the light around him. One entry stood out, a harrowing account of a night the shadow man had come to her. She had been lying in bed, awake, the moon offering meager light through the barred window. Her room had grown inexplicably cold, and then she'd felt it, a hand, icy and forceful, gripping her leg, pulling her. She had tried to scream, but no sound escaped. And then she'd seen him in the corner, a darker void in the darkness, watching, whispering words she couldn't quite hear, but felt like needles in her mind. I sat, frozen, her words painting a terrifying image that lingered behind my eyelids. The room felt colder, the shadows within stretching as the sun dipped lower outside. That's when I heard it a whisper, so soft it could have been my imagination, yet it prickled the hair on the back of my neck. Rattled, I shoved the diary into my bag, suddenly eager to escape the oppressive atmosphere of the room, to get away from the shadows that seemed just a bit too animate. I stumbled from the room, my footsteps quickening as I navigated the debris-strewn corridors, the building seeming to warp around me into a menacing labyrinth. As I emerged into the waning sunlight, I could have sworn I heard a low laugh resonating from the bowels of the asylum, a sound devoid of any humor, only promising darkness. I didn't look back, not until I was well away from the building and the suffocating aura it exuded. I've kept the diary, a chilling memento of that day. 
Sometimes, when the night is quiet and I dare to revisit its pages, I swear the temperature in my room drops several degrees and the shadows twitch just slightly. The whispers of the past, it seems, don't always like to be left behind. I've always been a deep sleeper, the kind who could sleep through thunderstorms and blaring alarms. So when I began feeling unusually fatigued during the day, I decided to invest in a sleep tracker. The sleek wristband would monitor my sleep patterns, providing insights into the quality and duration of my rest. The first morning after wearing it, I eagerly checked the data. To my surprise, the tracker showed periods of wakefulness during the night with a significant amount of activity around 3 a.m. According to the device, I had been up and walking around for nearly an hour. I brushed it off as a glitch, assuming the tracker needed calibration. But night after night, the pattern persisted. Each morning, the device showed me awake and active during the early hours, even though I had no recollection of ever leaving my bed. Curiosity turning to concern I decided to set up a night vision camera in my bedroom. If I was indeed sleepwalking, I wanted to know. The next morning, I played back the footage with bated breath. The room was bathed in the soft green glow of the night vision. For the first few hours, all was still. But then, around 3 a.m., something startling occurred. I saw myself sit up, eyes wide open, but with a vacant stare. Slowly, I climbed out of bed and began to wander around the room, touching objects, pausing occasionally as if listening to something inaudible. After nearly an hour, I returned to bed, settling back into a deep sleep. The footage was unsettling. My sleepwalking self moved with a deliberateness that was eerie, displaying behaviors and mannerisms I didn't recognize. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I consulted a sleep specialist. He diagnosed me with somnambulism, a sleep disorder that results in episodes of walking or performing complex tasks while asleep. Stress, he said, was a common trigger, but there was something he couldn't explain. During one of our sessions, I mentioned the way I'd pause during my nocturnal wanderings, as if listening to someone. Intrigued, he suggested an experiment we would conduct an overnight observation using sensitive audio equipment to pick up any sounds that might be occurring during my episodes. The results were chilling. During one of my sleepwalking episodes, the microphones picked up faint whispers, too soft to be discernible, but unmistakably human. The doctor was baffled, unable to provide a logical explanation. Returning home, I decided to delve into the history of my house a deep dive into local archives revealed a tragic tale. A century ago, a young woman named Clara had lived in the house. She had been known to converse with unseen friends, often wandering the house at night, whispering secrets into the dark. One fateful evening, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The parallels were uncanny. Was I tapping into some residual energy? reliving Clara's nocturnal conversations? Was she the source of the whispers? Seeking closure, I reached out to a medium. She conducted a seance, attempting to communicate with any spirits present. As the candles flickered, she made contact with Clara, who revealed her loneliness and desire for companionship. My sleepwalking episodes, it seemed, were a way for her to connect to relive her nightly wanderings. The medium helped guide Clara to find peace, releasing her from the confines of the house. That night, for the first time in weeks, my sleep tracker showed a full, uninterrupted night of rest. The experience left me with a profound sense of wonder and respect for the mysteries of the universe. It was a reminder that sometimes, the lines between the past and the present, the living and the dead, are more intertwined than we could ever imagine. 
Antarctica is not a place for the faint-hearted. It's a vast expanse where white and silence bleed into each other, rendering the landscape a blank canvas on which the mind can paint its deepest fears. As a research meteorologist stationed in McMurdo, I've braved conditions that would break a lesser soul. Howling winds, endless darkness, and temperatures that can freeze a man's spirit as easily as his flesh. But it's not the harshness of the climate that unnerves me. It's the whispers that come with the snowstorms. They're more than just auditory hallucinations. They've saved lives, including my own. You don't speak of them openly, those whispers. Antarctica has a way of humbling you, of making human words seem inadequate against its majestic and cruel indifference. But among the crew, we all know. When the snowstorms hit and the whispers come, you listen. It happened during a routine data collection mission. The sky had already turned an ominous gray, a storm brewing on the horizon, but we thought we'd have enough time. We thought wrong. Within minutes, visibility dropped to near zero, the snow a white haze that erased the distinction between earth and sky. The icy wind howled like a feral beast, gnawing through layers of thermal clothing. And then, through the cacophony, I heard it. A whisper so faint it could have been mistaken for a figment of my imagination. Left, it breathed, an ethereal wisp of sound snatched away by the gusts. My instincts screamed against it. Left would take us farther away from base, but something about that whisper felt different, like a thread of warmth woven into the frozen air. I looked at my fellow researcher, her eyes wide, her lips quivering with unspoken recognition. Did you hear it too? I mouthed. She nodded. Against reason, against logic, we veered left. The snow deepened, each step an effort that seemed to drain years from our lives. The whisper persisted, guiding us through the storm, as if an invisible hand was carving out a path for us to follow. Straight, it beckoned. Right, it urged, each direction accompanied by a growing sense of urgency. After what seemed an eternity, the tempest began to recede as if the elements had decided we'd earned our reprieve. Ahead of us, barely visible through the lifting mist, was the outline of an old supply cache. Forgotten by time but marked on no current map, it offered temporary refuge and, crucially, a radio. By the time we were rescued, the storm had unleashed its full fury on our original path. Had we not veered left when we did, we would have walked straight into an ice crevasse, an abyss hidden by the snow, our bodies forever entombed in Antarctic white. No one spoke of the whispers after that, but sometimes, in the middle of a snowstorm, when human voices are drowned by nature's roar, I'd catch Sarah's eye and see reflected there the inexplicable. It's as if Antarctica itself reached out to guide us through its icy maze, as if the very air we breathed bore messages from an unknown sender. Does it make me question the science I've dedicated my life to? The empirical reality I thought I knew? No, but it makes me wonder about the hidden dimensions of the world, the inexplicable phenomena that lie just beyond our understanding. In the realm of Antarctic white, where the line between life and death is as thin as the edge of a razor, those whispers are a reminder of our vulnerability, our insignificance in the grand scheme. Yet they're also a testament to the enduring mysteries of the world, unquantifiable threads that weave their way through the tapestry of human experience. And it's in that delicate balance between knowing and not knowing that I find my humility, my awe, 
and the endless fuel for the questions that drive us forward into the unknown. In 2007, I frequently traveled between Alberta and British Columbia with my then boyfriend, whom I'll refer to as John. The journey was breathtaking, meandering through mountains, glacial lakes, and impressive rock formations. I mention these details because I have a hunch they're relevant, though it's just a gut feeling. One particular morning before a trip, something shifted in my mind. I can't determine if something external caused this or if I was the catalyst. Although it might sound like I'm describing a schizophrenic episode, I want to clarify that I have PTSD and bipolar too, but not schizophrenia. If this doesn't fit the narrative, it's okay. The day started as any other, but a bizarre conviction overtook me. I felt certain that John was planning to kill me in the mountains on behalf of my father. This idea was preposterous. Neither my father nor John had any reason or inclination to harm me. Convinced of this alternate reality though, I confronted John. It seemed he shared this disturbing belief. He evaded my questions. And as my distress grew, his demeanor changed. His voice altered and subtle changes appeared on his face. He seemed to morph into someone else, a transformation I can't quite explain. Everything became surreal, like a lucid dream. The depth and complexity of the conversations and situations we found ourselves in were overwhelming. We discussed topics that I can't recall. At times, John seemed to alternate between himself and this other entity, who I whimsically identified as Satan or a manifestation of pure evil. Sounds crazy, right? By this time, I had worked as an escort in the city for about three years. This trip marked a turning point and I left that life behind. Fast forward a bit and things became even stranger. We had taken a different route, one that John was familiar with from his work travels. However, our journey between places seemed unnaturally fast, and the towns en route seemed incomplete or transitional. Time felt distorted. Though in real time, our trip took three days, it felt like a week had elapsed. When we finally reached the city, reality seemed to reassert itself, though not entirely. We intended to pick up furniture, but although I remember having the furniture later on, the act of acquiring it remains hazy. After leaving the city, the night seemed to fall suddenly, and we were back on that eerie road. Our reality became fragmented, shifting between different states of awareness. At times, John transformed into that malevolent being, while at other moments, he was just John. We found ourselves trapped in a looping timeline, one that only progressed when we made the right change. As things escalated, John's intent seemed murderous. I felt trapped in this cycle of dark and light. In my desperation, I prayed fervently, seeking help. Suddenly, I was outside the truck, running along the road, with John, or that other thing, chasing me in the vehicle. Despite the terror, I resolved to keep running, driven by sheer will. Then, abruptly, I was back in the truck with John. The terrifying alternate reality still lingered, but it slowly began to fade as daylight approached and we neared familiar places. There were a few lingering time loops, but we eventually returned home, where time flowed normally once again. John and I tried to process what happened, Initially, we discussed it in depth, but over time, John avoided the topic. The initial belief that he intended to kill me remained unexplained and unfounded. When I recounted the story to my father, he was upset, suspecting that I was using drugs or losing my sanity, but neither was true. 
For years, I have tried to locate that mysterious high road, but I've never succeeded. On two occasions, I felt I saw others using this road, once with a former boss after a traumatic work incident, and once with someone linked to my past in escorting. Both experiences predated that bewildering trip with John, and I can find absolutely no evidence that that road exists. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I can't explain any of these experiences. The old, wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back, of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the Hall of Mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations. It was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end, two paths diverging, one into memory, and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, the risks not ventured, but interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy. A kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds, and fears, 
revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. This incident occurred to my boyfriend and I roughly two years ago, deep into the night. I felt compelled to share this story as it has left an indelible mark on me and plagues me with nightmares to this very day. It was a September night around two o'clock in the morning. We live about 25 minutes outside a town in Northern British Columbia with our house nestled in the woods. Due to the seclusion of our road, we would typically pull out of our driveway before turning on our car lights, a quirky habit we both shared. After this night, however, our lights go on instantly. On this particular night, I was driving. As I made a left out of our driveway and switched on the high beams, we saw it. A strange, hairless, pale humanoid entity was crouched in the middle of the road. It almost appeared luminescent, but that might have been due to its extreme paleness reflecting the high beams. It sharply turned its head toward us, seemingly startled by our sudden illumination. In a matter of seconds, this being awkwardly moved across the road with disjointed motions, finally descending into the three foot deep ditch. But that wasn't the end of it. From the ditch, it turned to face us, standing upright on its hind legs. Its stance was eerily similar to a human, yet off. Considering the depth of the ditch, the creature loomed more than five feet above it, making it taller than our vehicle and putting its height at well over seven feet. It adopted an aggressive posture, shoulders hunched, leaning slightly forward peering intently at our car. And in that moment, I felt it. It wasn't just looking at our car. It was gazing intently through the window, directly at me. Its gaze conveyed an unsettling intelligence, as though it knew that we were the ones controlling the vehicle. Matching its pace with our car's crawl, I maintained eye contact watching it twist its neck to keep its gaze locked onto me even as we passed. Once it was out of sight, I refocused on the road ahead. Silence filled the car. We both processed the encounter in solitude, in our own minds, silent, driving under 10 kilometers per hour. I seldom recount the story, as many either scoff at it or attempt to rationalize it as a malnourished albino bear or things like that. Fast forward to a year later. Just before winter, his parents, who own a dog, came for a visit. One evening at dusk, his mother and I were enjoying a smoke on our six foot high deck. It's positioned on the same side as the road leading to town, giving us a vantage point to the patch of woods where the prior encounter took place. Suddenly, the sound of snapping twigs resonated, coinciding with the dog's frantic barking. Despite his small stature, the dog appeared ready to leap off of the deck and chase something into the woods. He didn't, and the dog is fine. Just as my boyfriend emerged from the house, amidst the trees, we caught a fleeting glimpse of a tall, slender, white figure. Its definitive features were obscured, and given his mother's poor eyesight and her missing glasses, she didn't see much. But a gut-wrenching sensation told me that it was the same entity. 
I chose to share this experience, hoping for understanding and perhaps belief from those in this community. Now, we avoid venturing outside after dark. Strangely, a part of me yearns to see it again. Before this incident, I had read similar stories with a sense of detached fascination. But actually locking eyes with such an entity? The awe and terror were unparalleled. I often ponder this experience. It is so deeply etched into my memory that even the mere thought can evoke tears of fear. I hope someone else finds this story as compelling as I do. The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart, ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Poco Moonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents, and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise, a low rumble like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. 
Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could. A shared encounter with the unexplained, forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore. Because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation. Something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. Life in my Michigan cabin had always been a tranquil experience, a deliberate withdrawal from the chaos of modern existence. Nestled deep in the woods, it was a place where time seemed to pause, where the relentless chatter of society was replaced by the hum of the wind and the chattering of woodland creatures. But that serenity would eventually give way to a series of disturbing events, events that would chip away at my skepticism and introduce me to a very real local legend, the Dogman. It all began on a crisp autumn evening. The leaves had turned a myriad of oranges and reds, and the air carried a fresh, earthy scent. I was chopping wood near my shed when I heard it. A low growl, different from the usual sounds that the forest animals made. It was guttural and strangely menacing. I paused, axe in hand, scanning the tree line for the source. But there was nothing, just the fading light casting long, haunting shadows. Over the next few weeks, odd occurrences started to disrupt the quietude of my life. I would wake up to find things outside my cabin moved or knocked over, my firewood scattered, my trash cans toppled, and most unsettlingly, claw marks on the trees surrounding my property. These were no ordinary marks. They were far too large and deliberate, not like anything that a deer or even a bear would make. The tension escalated one night when the growling returned. It was louder this time, closer, accompanied by heavy footsteps that circled my cabin. I sat in the darkness, clutching a hunting rifle, peering nervously through my curtains at the ominous void beyond the glass. Then I saw the eyes, two yellow orbs glowing in the dark staring directly at me. My heart pounded in my chest as a figure emerged from the shadows, tall and bipedal, covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was a nightmarish blend of man and wolf, and in that chilling moment, I knew I was face to face with the dog man. Our eyes locked and the creature let out a haunting howl that echoed through the forest filling the air with a palpable sense of dread. I raised my rifle, my hands shaking, but the creature seemed to sense my intention and vanished into the woods, its growl fading into the distance, but its presence lingering like an unspoken threat. Days turned into weeks and the incidents around my cabin continued, yet I couldn't bring myself to leave. This was my home and I would not be driven out by fear. But I took precautions, installing heavy-duty locks and reinforcing my windows, always keeping my rifle within arm's reach. Then came the night that would forever alter my understanding of the world. A powerful storm was rolling in, the wind howling like a chorus of anguished souls, the trees swaying violently in the tempest. It was the perfect backdrop for the dogman's return, and return it did. The creature appeared at my window, its eyes glowing even brighter against the stormy darkness, its snarl sending a chill down my spine. But this time I was ready. I grabbed my rifle, aimed at those menacing eyes, and fired. The bullet shattered the window and hit its mark, but the creature let out a howl, not of pain, but of anger, of indignation. It backed away, its eyes locked onto mine for one last moment before disappearing into the tempest, leaving me with a shattered window 
and a shattered worldview. I spent the rest of that stormy night in a state of heightened alert, rifle in hand, grappling with the surreal reality of my situation. I had faced the Dogman, a creature of local legend and frightening reality, and had come away with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lurk in the Michigan woods. The experiences around my cabin have since quieted down, but the sense of unease remains. I've shared my story with a few close friends who have met it with a mixture of skepticism and intrigued concern. And while I don't know if the dog man will ever return, I continue to live here in my secluded Michigan cabin, forever aware that some legends are grounded in truths too unsettling to dismiss, lurking in the shadows of both our world and our imagination. The gate was rusted, the fence overgrown, but the foreboding air around the old military base remained palpable. I had heard stories, of course, urban legends of secret experiments and concealed truths, but those tales didn't deter me. Armed with a camera and the boundless optimism of an explorer, I pushed through the rotting barriers. The base lay like a fossilized relic, caught between the past and an uncertain decay. Buildings stood emptied of life, yet filled with the ghosts of classified actions. Most doors were locked or jammed, but one yielded as if inviting me into its secrets. It was an underground bunker, a dark descent into subterranean chambers. I flicked on my flashlight, illuminating corridors lined with locked metal cabinets and old office furniture. Then something caught my eye, a file cabinet standing slightly ajar, its lock apparently defeated by time or previous intruders. Curiosity pulled me closer. The first few folders were mundane, predictable stuff, budget reports and duty rosters. But then I found it, a file marked with a symbol I had never seen, but instantly understood as being not of this world. It was as if the very sight of it instilled the symbol's meaning into my brain. Alliance. My hands shook as I leafed through the documents. What they revealed was a narrative so outrageous, yet so meticulously detailed, that disbelief turned into dread. This was no conspiracy theory. This was an actual alliance between high-ranking government officials and an alien civilization identified only by the same strange symbol. The file outlined joint projects, exchanges of technology and information, plans for public disclosure, and contingencies for keeping it all under wraps. Dates spanned decades, and some even projected into the future. Upcoming rendezvous, expected technological handovers, even a long-term agenda for the slow integration of the two civilizations. What really seized my attention was the handwritten notes scribbled in the margins, desperate warnings from what seemed like a dissenting officer. We don't know their true objectives, one note read. We are fools playing with fire, declared another. As I flipped through the last pages, I realized the documents became increasingly recent. The most chilling entry was the last, a single sentence typed and underlined, final phase initiation imminent. A shiver crawled up my spine. I looked around, suddenly conscious of the enclosing darkness, of how deep underground I was, of how alone I felt. The air thickened and for the first time I considered that I might not be alone at all. Just then, a noise echoed through the bunker, a mechanical hum gradually intensifying. My flashlight flickered, then died, plunging me into oppressive darkness. I fumbled to get it back on, heart racing, but it seemed drained of power. In that darkness, I felt a presence, not human, 
yet undeniably sentient, surrounding and analyzing me. Curiosity is both your strength and your downfall, a voice resonated in my mind. I recognized the form of telepathic communication, a cold stream of thoughts invading my consciousness. You have discovered a truth not meant for your kind, not yet. The weight of those words left me paralyzed. I felt my thoughts being sifted, evaluated, my actions weighed for their potential ripple effects. And as quickly as it came, the presence receded, fading into the depths of the hidden chambers around me. I found myself alone in the dark, the mechanical hum slowly receding, replaced by an unsettling silence. By some miracle, or perhaps an alien override, my flashlight flickered back to life. I left the file where I found it, hastily exiting the bunker, and I fled the military base, my every step shadowed by an eerie sense of being watched. Days turned to weeks, and no one came looking for me. Life resumed its old rhythm, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being a marked man, of knowing too much, yet understanding too little. Recently, I've noticed them, people who don't quite fit in, whose gaze lingers a little bit too long, who vanish when I look again. They're always there, on the periphery of my life, never intervening, but always observing. And each night as I try to sleep, the last thought that crosses my mind is that single haunting sentence, final phase initiation imminent. I still don't know what it means or when it will happen, but the unsettling realization lingers. I am now a small involuntary part of this looming final phase, whatever it is. And so I wait, wondering when the true cost of my curiosity will reveal itself. Waking up that morning felt like emerging from a nightmare, but the terror didn't end with consciousness. I blinked my eyes open to a room transformed. The walls of my bedroom were etched with symbols, alien, incomprehensible marks that glowed faintly in the early morning light. My heart pounded. This was no prank. I live alone, secure in a third floor apartment with a digital lock. Scanning the room, everything else was untouched. My phone on the nightstand, clothes tossed casually on the chair. Even a small pile of books seemed as undisturbed as ever. Only the walls bore these disquieting scars. I got up, my feet hitting the cold floor as I approached one of the symbols. Up close, the markings looked almost organic a series of intertwining shapes that seemed to shift when I wasn't looking directly at them. I reached out to touch one, and the moment my fingers brushed against it, a jolt of icy dread ran down my spine. Instantly, I withdrew my hand, my skin tingling, as if the walls themselves had warned me to keep my distance. The day unfolded in a haze. I snapped photos of the walls and sent them to a friend who dabbled in linguistics and cryptography. Any idea what these are? I texted. Hours later, a reply. Never seen anything like it. Are you sure it's not just some avant-garde art? It was no art. As night fell, my apartment grew unnaturally cold, and the symbols seemed to pulsate, as if drawing energy from the darkness. I wrapped myself in a blanket and sat on the bed, my eyes darting from one glowing mark to the next. And that's when I heard it. A whisper so soft it was almost drowned out by the hum of the refrigerator from the kitchen. It seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, unintelligible but filled with a foreboding urgency. Then my phone buzzed. An email, the sender's address a jumble of characters and numbers, the subject line consisting of the same alien symbols that adorned my walls. 
I opened it, my hands trembling. The email contained only a single line of text, but it was in plain English. Do not resist. Preparation is complete. Preparation for what? Suddenly, the lights flickered. The room plunged into darkness for a moment before the power returned, but something had changed. The symbols on the walls were now glowing brighter, a radiant azure that cast eerie shadows on the furniture, and they were moving. Not just shifting subtly as before, but truly moving, rearranging themselves into a new pattern. Before my eyes, they converged toward a single point on the wall, the shapes merging into one large, complex symbol that seemed to pulsate with a life of its own. The dread that had been my constant companion now escalated into raw fear. I grabbed my coat and keys, my instincts screaming at me to get out. As I reached for the doorknob, I heard the whisper again, louder this time, almost a growl a guttural sequence of sounds that reverberated in the air and within my own skull. I pulled open the door, fleeing into the corridor without a second glance back. But even as I pounded down the stairs and burst into the night, I knew escape was not that simple. My walls had become a canvas for something beyond my understanding, a message or a warning from entities unknown. The symbols are still there, haunting my dreams and my waking moments. I've tried painting over them, but they bleed through, their glow undiminished. Friends have come over, offering theories and potential solutions, everything from sage smudging to contacting paranormal investigators, but none have dared to touch the glyphs. I now sleep with the lights on, an uneasy truce with the incomprehensible, but the email haunts me, those words a constant echo. Do not resist. Preparation is complete. And the same question lingers. Preparation for what? The dread remains, an eternal undercurrent to my existence. I'm caught in a web of cosmic forces, a pawn in a game with rules I can't fathom. Every morning I wake to those walls, the symbols a constant reminder of my entanglement in something far larger and more terrifying than I'd ever imagined. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear whispers, new sounds, new sequences, each more urgent than the last. I can't shake the feeling that something is coming, something momentous and irrevocable. But what it is, and what role these alien glyphs have in it, remains maddeningly, terrifyingly unclear. I don't know how long I was out before I came to, strapped naked on a cold metal table in a sterile white room. My foggy brain struggled to piece together some explanation from how I went from driving home from work to this. Blurry figures moved in my peripheral vision. I tried to lift my head for a better look, but some invisible force held it locked in place. A tall, gangly creature entered my field of vision. He had a bulbous bald head with opaque black eyes and pale gray skin that seemed to glow under the harsh lights. Spindly fingers covered in some sort of black gloves or claws tapped a device it held in its equally spindly hands. I opened my mouth to speak, scream, anything, but quickly realized I was also paralyzed from the neck down. Helpless panic gripped every fiber of my being. The creature must have sensed my terror. In my mind, I heard a thin, reedy voice. Do not be frightened. We intend you no harm. We only wish to improve your species, to prepare you for what is coming. Invisible claws clamped down on my head as an excruciating pain ricocheted through my skull. It felt like my brain was being shredded and reassembled 
as images and concepts flashed before my eyes. Advanced technology, complex mathematics, cosmic disasters, future events. More creatures entered the room and began manipulating my limbs, injecting substances, prodding and poking me. After what felt like an eternity of tests, my overwhelmed mind gratefully slid into unconsciousness. I awoke some time later back in my car, parked in my driveway. My head throbbed as I tried to piece together if it had all been some bizarrely vivid nightmare. But the lingering pain in my temples and dried blood under my nose told me otherwise. Those creatures, whatever they were, had been inside my head, and they did something to me. In all the days that followed, the changes began. Headaches persisted no matter how many pain pills I took. But I also noticed food no longer satisfied my gnawing hunger. My vision sharpened until I could read license plates from a block away. The strange voices in my head grew louder. I started having vivid premonitions that would come true. A coworker's car crash, an election upset, even trivial things like TV scheduling changes or pop quiz questions. Somehow I could glimpse upcoming events, almost like watching a stream of the future. My body changed too. I no longer seemed to need sleep, yet woke every morning feeling fully energized. Previously sluggish thinking accelerated to lightning speed. I solved complex equations instantly and remembered entire textbooks word for word. But the toll was immense migraines that sometimes left me writhing, incapacitated on the floor for hours. At work, I predicted a system failure before it happened, saving us millions. My bosses said I was brilliant. Little did they know alien abductors did something to transform me into a superhuman freak. Part of me wanted to tell the world, to find meaning in my violation, but how could I without sounding insane? The voices in my head had grown to a constant chaotic chorus only I could hear. They whispered horrors, crashes, explosions, suffering and death on global scales. I caught glimpses of creatures and spacecraft hidden behind a thin veil that previously concealed them. The experiments performed on me clearly ruptured the flimsy illusion separating our ordinary reality from levels beyond. I tried drowning the voices out with music, drugs, anything I could think of, but they only intensified. Soon they were screaming, pleading with me to act before the coming cataclysm. I wasn't sure if I was tapping into some real truth or simply going mad. Maybe I already was. The final straw came after a week of ceaseless migraines and zero sleep. In the mirror, my eyes appeared blackened from burst blood vessels. My gums bled spontaneously, and my fingers trembled uncontrollably. How long until whatever alien substance they pumped me with finally killed me? That night, as I rocked and muttered to myself, a booming voice cut through the others, commanding me, Go to the cave. Our technology can save you and your planet, but time grows short. Somehow I knew exactly the cave it meant, one I had played in as a child on family camping trips. I tore out of my house and sped recklessly into the hills until I came to that familiar rocky outcropping. A perfect full moon illuminated the small black mouth of the cave's entrance. I stumbled inside, not even questioning my surreal actions, lured by a promise of relief from the unrelenting torment. Deeper, I crawled until the narrow walls opened into a large cavern with a glowing blue light at its center. Mesmerized, I stepped toward it. The angry chorus in my head became a single high-pitched drone the closer I came to that glow. I realized my mistake too late. I had walked right into their trap. The force that seized control of my body was even greater than during the first abduction. I was a puppet compelled by some external power to march stiffly toward that pulsing light, compelled to become something far from human. Just as my hand reached for the hypnotic light, instinct took over. 
I wrenched back control of my body and let out a primal scream of rage at the creatures who thought they could dictate my fate. With the last of my energy, I ripped a sharp stone from the cavern wall and plunged it into my chest, collapsing as hot blood gushed. I lie gasping on the cold cave floor, life ebbing away, but at least I would die as myself and not their specimen. As my vision faded, I heard their frustrated screams fade to silence. I can only pray my small act of defiance delayed their apocalypse just a while longer, so someone else might find a way to avoid the grim future preordained for our race. A future I glimpsed in my final moments, our planet harvested and humanity mutated into some cold new form. But perhaps we still have time to forge another path. Perhaps. It had been a long day at work. One of those days where every tick of the clock feels like a jab to the ribs. All I wanted was to slide into the subway seat, zone out and make it home. The doors whooshed open, and I stepped onto the train without even glancing up from my phone. But when I did look up, the world seemed to freeze around me. Every face on the train was mine. They were all sitting there, each version of me occupying the seats, gripping the poles, even leaning against the doors. Some wore the same expression of weary fatigue that I felt. Others were engrossed in books or staring at their phones but they were all unmistakably me. My breath hitched. Was this some elaborate prank? Virtual reality? My mind scrambled for an explanation, but came up empty. The train jolted into motion, forcing me to grab a pole for balance. My eyes darted from one face to another, each pair of eyes, my eyes, locking onto me with varying degrees of shock or curiosity. Next stop, 23rd Street, the intercom announced, but the voice was my own. The other me's began to whisper amongst themselves, each conversation like an echo chamber of my own thoughts. Words like glitch and reality floated in the air, merging into an indecipherable murmur. One version of me, seated near the door, patted the empty seat next to her. Hesitant, I walked over and sat down. Up close, I could see the tiny details that made us identical. The same mole on the chin, the same chipped nail polish. Any idea what's going on? She asked. Her voice was as familiar as my own thoughts. I was hoping you would know, I said. A heavy silence followed, punctuated only by the screech of the subway against the rails. 23rd Street, exit for Chelsea and Madison Square. My voice announced through the intercom as the train pulled into the station. The doors opened, but no one moved. Who would? Stepping off this train felt like stepping off the edge of reality. The doors closed, and the train moved on. As the minutes ticked by, the atmosphere grew tense. Some of my clones began to pace the car. Others were in heated discussions, gesturing wildly. A few even seemed to be in tears. We were a microcosm of emotions, each one amplified by its reflection in the others. Next stop, into the line, the intercom said. That wasn't right. There should have been at least three more stops before the terminus. A collective sense of dread filled the car. The train pulled into an unlit station, the walls of which were pure black, as if they were made from darkness itself. The doors opened. On the platform stood another version of me, her eyes filled with a calm, almost serene authority. She spoke without boarding the train. This is where you get off, all of you. This is the end of the line. The other me's began to exit the train. I followed suit, stepping onto the dark platform. It was cold here, as if the very air was devoid of life. Is this, what is this place? I asked the version of me on the platform. She looked at me, her eyes like bottomless wells. 
It's a nowhere place between the cracks of reality, she said. And now that you're here, there's something you all need to do. And what's that? I asked. Choose. Choose what? Who gets to go back? A hushed silence descended on the platform. Go back? Go back to what? To being the only one? The only me? Only one can return, she continued. The rest will stay here, in the nowhere place. Arguments erupted around me. How do you fight for your own life against yourself? How do you prove you're the real one when everyone is a perfect copy? Then it hit me. The coat I was wearing, a new purchase just this morning, a coat none of the others wore. It was a small detail, but in a situation where everything was an echo, it made me the original. I stepped forward. I'm the one who should go back. I'm wearing a coat none of you have. It proves I'm the original. The authoritative me looked at me, her eyes softening. Very well, she said, and with a wave of her hand, the world around me started to dissolve in a swirl of colors. When I came to, I was back on the train, pulling into my regular stop. This time, the faces around me were their usual mix of strangers. Trembling, I exited the train and climbed up the stairs to the street level. As I reached the top, my phone buzzed. A message from an unknown number flashed on the screen. It read, Nice coat. It suits you well. I looked around, my eyes scanning the crowd. Then, I saw her, a few yards away, disappearing into the throng of people. Me, wearing the exact same coat, her eyes meeting mine one last time before she was swallowed by the city. The first message came on a rainy April morning, exactly one year after you passed away. I had just set a bouquet of your favorite daffodils by your headstone, tears flowing freely down my cheeks at the loss of you, my mentor, my guiding light. A cool breeze stirred the cemetery trees as I turned to leave. That's when your voice whispered on the wind, faint but unmistakable. Do not weep for me, my child. I am not gone, merely transformed. I froze, wondering if grief was making me hear things, but the voice persisted, reassuring, gently amused, just like your tone in life. You said you spoke to me now from another plane of existence, where your consciousness had awakened to new depths. You were at peace there, among a collective energy, a community of ascended souls. Over my shock, I managed to ask if you could still see our earthly realm. You affirmed brightly, saying you were always near, watching over me. You told me death was no end, but rather a passage to transcend boundaries that limited our human forms. There was more to learn, you said, mysteries far exceeding anything we could conceive with earthly minds alone. Before the voice faded, you left me with a final reassurance. All will be revealed soon. I stood in awe, tears now of elation streaking my face. My rational mind rejected it as fantasy, a hallucination conjured by grief. But my heart felt irrevocably changed by hearing your voice again, sensing your presence close. You were gone in body, but your light truly lived on. I withdrew from friends in the months that followed, talking breathlessly about our communication and the revelations you hinted at. They wore pained expressions, advising therapy to accept your death, but I knew what I heard. I waited expectantly for your promised return. It came on the summer solstice, an envelope appearing mysteriously on my nightstand. The handwriting within was unmistakably yours. You asked if I was ready to understand now. That night I dreamed of floating up to meet your shimmering spirit. You led me through a portal into an astonishing multi-dimensional existence, 
culminating and merging ecstatically with the collective you described. I awoke changed to my core. I now devoted myself feverishly to meditation, channeling anything to reconnect us. Finally, your voice came again, stronger now. You urged me to share the truths you revealed, waking humanity from limited perception. But those around me feared for my health, threatening doctors and drugs. One sweltering night, you spoke your most shocking message. Soon, you would send a sign in the skies to make all doubt cease. Until then, I must have faith. I awoke the next morning to video footage on the news of mysterious global lights. They called them a coincidence, but I knew. Your promised sign was coming. I climbed to a remote hilltop you led me to in dreams. That night, those same ethereal lights bloomed brighter above, undulating hypnotically. Your voice resonated powerfully within my mind. The moment had come. I would be the vessel through which the collective consciousness poured in, elevating humanity. As my body rose skyward, bathed in radiance, euphoria overwhelmed me. I glimpsed eternity, knowing my form was just melting back into the infinite one source. But I saw people exiting their homes, staring up in awe at the mesmerizing lights. You urged me, gently, to release the divine wisdom I now harbored into them. As I spoke, swaying in the air, people dropped to their knees, weeping, overcome by transcendent understanding. The fearful world I knew dissolved, birthing a new society living by cosmic truth, awakened to their eternal spirits. Our loving merge was finally complete. Some called it a rapture, others a revelation, but I knew it as the triumph you had promised from that first whisper on the wind. You came back as an ambassador to bridge humanity to its next phase. My long, strange journey conversing with your spirit made me the unlikely prophet to spread this mystical rebirth worldwide. I still watch over the blessed children of the New Age from my dwelling in the light, and I see your soul shining closest to mine, as it has through every realm beyond time and space and imagination. My words could never encapsulate the bond tying us in ecstatic energy no form can contain. I wait patiently for the day that your voice finally calls me home. It was a slow night. Halfway into my graveyard shift as a security guard, I found myself slumped in my chair, sipping stale coffee and watching feeds from the security camera. Monitors flickered in a rhythmic cycle through different angles of the hospital. Corridors, waiting rooms, stairwells. The place was a labyrinth after dark, silent except for the hum of machinery. My eyes were getting heavy when I saw it. Camera 12, third floor corridor. A shadowy figure moved along the wall, elongated and indistinct. I blinked, rubbed my eyes. The figure remained, inching closer to the far end of the hallway where it intersected with another. I glanced at the clock, 3.07 AM. Grabbing my flashlight and keys, I made my way to the third floor. Adrenaline cut through my drowsiness. Either somebody had breached security, or I was chasing phantoms. The elevator dinged softly, doors sliding open. I stepped out, flicked on the flashlight, and swept the beam down the corridor. Nothing. I checked the adjacent hallways, even popped into a few rooms. No sign of an intruder. Yet the unsettling sensation of being observed washed over me. I shook it off and headed back to the control room, a rational part of me figuring it was a camera glitch or a trick of the light. Back at my desk, I rewound the footage. The shadowy figure reappeared at the same spot, moving in the same direction, fading as it reached the hallway's end. 
no logical explanation came to mind. I logged the incident, noting the time and camera number, though omitting my eerie feelings. No need for people to question my sanity. In the nights that followed, I watched that corridor like a hawk. The figure never reappeared, but the memory lurked in the back of my mind, a puzzle with missing pieces. And though I still patrol the third floor, I do it with a quicker step, always reminding myself to breathe, especially when my flashlight casts long shadows on the wall. Thank you.